Let's see if this works. Hello, hello, good morning. Good morning. I'm gonna look for the senator here. Let's see, she's not here yet. How is everybody this morning? If you are not registered to vote, you can go to imavoter.com, find everything there about how to register, find out if you're registered, She's not here yet, but hopefully she'll be here soon. I'm like right up in there. Um, I'm excited and I'm nervous to talk with you guys this morning. Um, I'm gonna really talk a lot about myself and what's important to me. Um, Politically, sometimes I talk about that, but um, personally, what's important to me and why this election is important to me. So, um, I think we should be here in like a minute or two. Um, but I'm excited to talk to you guys this morning and to hear from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Um, I'm a really big admirer of hers. She's been an incredible champion of women's rights, um, the fight for equality, um, equal pay, a lot of things that are really important to me. Um, she's a senator in New York State, which is my hometown. Um, oh my God. <gasps> Somebody is just saying that they remember that I was in the movie Genius, which is really just very embarrassing. I was very, very young in that movie. I think I had my first kiss on that movie. So there's that. I think I was flying when that happened. So that was a lot. Um, Hopefully she'll be here soon. Um, in any case, what are you guys? What are you guys doing this morning? Where are you guys? I am. I may or may not be in a class right now. Mm, you may want to pay attention to your class, but I did class online. I did all of my high school online because um, uh, I was already acting and traveling around. So I definitely. Um, didn't pay attention all the time. I think the senator has requested me and go oh, live. Let's see if this works. Let's see, let's see, let's see. And hopefully my mom will stop blowing up my phone. Hello! Can you hear me? I cannot hear you. How odd. I can't hear you at all. Can you guys hear the Senator? I don't have AirPods in, no, and I, nothing is connected. Hmm. Sarah Pine, are you troubleshooting me? You can't hear her, okay. Okay, good, okay, well, not good. The Senator will hopefully get her sound fixed. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I am excited to talk to her whenever we can hear from her. Um, what issues are important to you guys this year? Um, maybe we can ask her some of those questions. Hopefully she's gonna log back in. Oh, here she is. Let's see if we can get her back. I feel like the Verizon guy. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Hi. Can you oh, there you are. Oh, how wonderful. Hello. <laughs> That's so good. So I liked your topics. Um, uh, I think you were talking about what people are up to during COVID. Um, what are you doing during COVID? Uh, well, I'm doing a lot of mask wearing. <laughs> I'm doing um, 
some minimal social distancing, seeing my friends. Um, my husband and I have pretty strict protocols about our health. Um, uh, I'm here uh, in LA uh, with my husband and my two dogs and a cat. Um, I desperately miss New York, um, which is my hometown, and I'm hoping to come back for winter. Um, so, but we've mostly been here. We've been reading and writing and my husband's getting ready to direct things and um, works a little bit on hold until uh, the health crisis is, um, is solved. Um, but I, I'm so grateful for my health and for my family's health and my friend's health. And um, I'm grateful to talk to you. How have you been holding up? Well, you know, I've got a 12 year old in class right now and he's doing his best. It's not easy. Um, and he's got class till 1130 and then I have to quickly make him some lunch and then I'll head to the Senate for votes this afternoon. But I think for every parent that's home with their kids, it's really hard because first of all, we're not educators. We're not um, trained to be good teachers. And second, um, our kids don't necessarily want our help anyway. So it's, we're just not ideal for this learning at home situation. But we're trying. I mean, every parent I know is, you know, doing their best and it's, it's all we can do. And, you know, it's a weird time. Yeah. Are you in New York right now? Mm -mm. In Washington, because uh, we have votes this week. So we're here. Uh, we hope to go back to upstate New York, um, you know, certainly for Thanksgiving, maybe in the fall when we, when we go out of session. But Dave, Mitch McConnell, now that the Supreme Court issues come up, he's going to surely try to keep us here to vote on this terrible nominee. Um, she really uh, doesn't share our values on pretty much anything. And, and the biggest I concern I have Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yes. Yeah, so, so we all know we mourn the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was an icon. She was a legend. She was a woman who literally took the law places where it had never been uh, because she was so determined to focus on equality, equal justice under law, just like it's written on the Supreme Court building. And Mitch McConnell has said he is going to replace her with a ultra right wing judge, uh, a person who um, does not share certainly my values on access to health care is a human right. Um, there's a decision coming up right away in November that um, could take away health care for millions of people, um, which during an epidemic would be an outrage. And then second, um, uh, she's not consistent with me on women's reproductive rights or on LGBTQ rights or immigrant rights or clean air, clean water. So she's very, very, very uh, ultra conservative, which would harm so many New Yorkers and it's just certainly against my values. So Mitch is going to keep us in session to jam this, this justice through. And so I'm waiting here to do what I can do to block it, to fight against it, to speak against it, to tell people why she's a terrible nominee. And um, so hopefully we can convince our Republican colleagues that this, that this choice is unfair and, and bad for America. You've never really, um, and sometimes a little bit controversially, you've never had a problem speaking out against people in your own party that you didn't agree with. Sure. And so how do you reach across the aisle and a a appeal to people's sense of morality and what's right? You know, we're just coming out of Yom Kippur last night. Yes. Um, Yom Kippur, for those of you watching who don't know, is um, uh, I'm Jewish and was raised Jewish. And it's the start at the beginning of our new year where we take moral inventory of who we have been and how we can do better and how we can try to create a world, not just within ourselves, but within our community that right. reflects the ideals that we take pride in as a person and as a country. And it feels like these issues and this election really has to be from a place of empathy and from a place of kindness and humanity and what's right and about creating dignity and opportunity for everyone and equality for everyone. And um, it, it can't just be about walking the party line. So how are you going to approach that? So I agree that this election is about much more than any election we've ever known because President Trump has really spent his last four years dividing the country um, on every racial, religious, socioeconomic line he can find. 
And he does it purposefully because he wants to uh, let people know that, that he doesn't represent them. So he, he's really incredibly divisive and a lot of his, his uh, rhetoric is hate filled. And unfortunately it's been inspiring um, not only uh, people to protest um, around the country, but he's also inspired unfortunately violence and he's inspired um, division. And so uh, we have our work cut out for us. So I think for me personally, I'll just keep lifting up the voices of those who aren't being heard, those who aren't being listened to. If we are able to defeat Trump and elect Joe Biden, I will make sure I pass bills that hopefully he will sign, like a national paid leave bill, uh, like equal pay for equal work, uh, affordable daycare, universal pre-K, structural changes that will help most people get back on their feet and help the economy grow. Um, I'll work on ways to help the fact that so many people are unemployed, uh, guaranteeing job training for anyone who's unemployed or underemployed, uh, a universal jobs act. That's the kind of approach I think and bold approaches that this country needs. I also want to put in place postal banking because one of the things we have, one of our worries is, is the post office going to be strong enough for and have the resources they need for this election? And so I want to create more resources there. And one way to do that is let them, let post offices also serve as banks. They used to do it from the turn of the century to the 1960s. And if you allow them to do basic checking and savings for low income families who don't have access to bank accounts because the banks don't offer it because they're not worth their time, um, you can create $9 billion a year in, in revenue for the banks. I mean, not for the banks, for the post office. And so if you were able to fund it through postal banking, you could strengthen it for this election and the next. So that's one of the big ideas that I want us to talk about and debate. And hopefully those are all ones that um, uh, I can get Democrats and Republicans to support. And I believe Joe Biden, it's part of his vision. It's part of the things that Joe Biden wants to accomplish. He wants to fix the economy. He wants to rebuild it back better. Uh, he doesn't want to rely on what's it done in the past because it didn't work for everybody. And so I'm going to hopefully be a, a partner in the Senate to deliver the bills that he will sign and then implement to make the country stronger. Thank you for all of that. That all sounds tremendous. Um, I want to circle back to equal pay because that's a, an issue that's particularly meaningful to me. Um, people that are in here may or may not be aware that I thought what uh, became unintentionally uh, a very public battle for equal pay. Um, and uh, I, I, it was a battle that ultimately I won. Um, but I won it because ultimately I knew that I was willing and able to walk away from that job and right. had that privilege. I knew that I would be okay for a couple months till I got a new job. And I knew that this issue was incredibly important to me. And I had waited years and years and years for this and couldn't wait any longer. Um, it's another issue that you and Vice President Biden care tremendously about. Um, I know that one of the first pieces of legislation um, that Biden and Obama put in um, was for equal pay. Um, yep. Still not enough, right? We know that that disparity only increases when you talk about people of color. Um, when you talk about black women who are making 60 cents on the dollar and Latina women who are making 50 something cents on the dollar. And when you talk about larger bodied people, when you talk about trans women, how, what are we going to do? Um, and what will Joe Biden do? And what will you do to ensure that people are being treated equally and are being paid for equal jobs. Right. So there's a huge disparity. Uh, women aren't paid as much as man, men. Women of color aren't paid as much as uh, white women. And so we're challenged because um, the way the economy works right now is it doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. So what our equal pay bill would do is incentivize companies to actually publish what they pay people for different jobs. So if you have um, someone doing this job and it's a man and he gets paid this, then it's published. So a, a woman who works in that job or a trans person who works in that job um, could uh, see directly, oh, I'm not being paid fa fairly. So they'd have the information that they need to actually file a lawsuit or to even just go to their boss and say, I really want to raise. It's not fair that I'm doing the same job as Joe and not getting the same amount of money. So that's the thing that um, we'd like to pass. And that would complement what Barack Obama and Joe Biden did in the last administration, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. 
which gave you the right to sue as soon as you found out that you weren't being paid fairly because there was there was no incentive for companies to be open about how much people were getting and people would find out long times after their statute of limitations is run and couldn't sue super <laughs> awkward right yeah. you don't wanna, that, what you make is incredibly personal but it should be equitable and it's hard to figure out what people are making people aren't open about it you hear things about the water around the water cooler and slowly you start to realize that you're being undervalued and it just feels really excuse me fucked yeah, it's terrible. And um, it happens to, to people everywhere. And so we want to make sure that we put in these rules that allow for transparency, number one, because in some companies, you'd be fired if you talked about your salary. So we want to make sure nobody can be fired for talking about their salary and actually give benefits to companies that are willing to publish who makes what where. So that's what we're working on. Um, in terms of other equitable support, making sure we have national paid leave. If we had had paid leave during this pandemic, mm -hmm. people kept their jobs and just taken up to three months off to be with their kids while they're being schooled remotely or to heal, to, to overcome COVID or to help someone in your family who was sick. It would have been so much easier to handle COVID um, if we had had equal pay in this country. And we're the, the only industrialized country in the whole world that doesn't have it. So it's a real shame. So that's another larger um, issue that we want to put together. And then things like universal pre-K or affordable daycare. Um, for young parents, it's really hard to manage ch childcare and be at work. And so we want to make sure pre-K is actually in public school year. And we want to make sure that uh, daycare can be more accessible. Unfortunately, because of COVID, a lot of daycares have closed. And so it's a huge problem. And in New York, there used to be one slot for every four kids that needed it. Now there's one slot for every eight kids that need it. So we're in a tough, tough place. That's awful. Yeah. And, and speaking of COVID, we know that having been um, exposed to the coronavirus um, will now be considered a pre-existing condition. Right. Um, so we know that our president lied to us about how we could contract this virus, diminished its, its severeness. Um, knew exactly how it could be contracted, yet did not recommend wearing masks and still really doesn't. He, he mishandled um, so much. It was very frustrating. It, it, it feels um, to not be given the truth and the information feels like you're being treated like a stupid child um, that isn't respected. Um, that's exactly how I feel. I often want to leave the frame when he's around. Um, I blow my nose. <laughs> Um, so, so now that we know that, and, and, you know, I have, I have, um, friends who thank God have recovered and don't seem to have any, um, lingering health issues, but I also have friends that had no, um, pre-existing conditions before COVID and they're my age, they're very healthy, they're young mothers and yeah. they now have vertigo and dizzy spells and heart uh, odd rhythms and they have to join studies because their doctors don't know how to help them. This thing yeah. is normal and it's not like oh. the yeah. We know so little about this disease. It's true. And, and get rid of the Affordable Care Act that we will get rid of people's abilities to protect themselves in the future against a disease that, they, that it's not their fault that they had. Um, right. What can we do about that? Well, um, first of all, we need to defeat Trump because he's not using the power of the presidency to help. So he should have used it to use the Defense Production Act to make sure people could have universal masks, to make sure we could have universal testing, to make sure we manufactured the swabs and the reagents and everything that we've had shortages of. And so that's frustrating because um, we need that. We, need, we, we, we needed that out of our president and didn't have it. So that's problem one. Problem two is Joe Biden, when he's in charge, he will not only have the supplies we need, but he'll guarantee we can have testing in all 50 states when people need it. And so people can know whether they have it so they don't spread it. Um, we can uh, guarantee health care is a right. Um, I'd like to try for Medicare for all, at least um, a, maybe a public option uh, as the way to get into it, give people the option to buy in at a price they can afford so that you have competition with a for-profit insurance system uh, with a not-for-profit system. And I think that's the best way to get to universal coverage um, and to get to Medicare for all is let's start with a buy-in. And that's something I think I can begin to work on in the Senate and hopefully pass uh, so that uh, we can put that in place. Um, and then we need the research. I mean, so many people, we don't know the long-term impacts of COVID. We need to fund the NIH. We need to fund 
yes. trans we need to fund um, the kind of research that saves lives. And Joe Biden will do that. He will absolutely fund research. He believes in it. Um, and, uh, you know, Joe and I have a lot in common when it comes to helping the troops and helping service members, um, and particularly the ones who have been at burn pits. And during the Afghanistan war and the Iraq war, they breathed in these horrible toxins, which are similar to the toxins that were released at ground zero after 9-11. And a lot of people have died of cancer. So that's something we're gonna look for research as well um, and really fund our medical research. And I think under a Biden-Harris presidency, that'll be one of their highest priorities. Well, that gives me a lot of confidence, especially because our current president talks about people that have been lost in our military as losers and suckers. And the kind of rhetoric and unkindness and lack of moral compass and just cruelty that he spews every single day. You know, when I was thinking about, um, when I was thinking about Yom Kippur, I was also thinking about this election that's coming up. And I was thinking about um, how I think I had a lot of hubris going into the last election. Like part of Yom Kippur is like taking inventory, like what can I do better now? I think hockey, I think the way that I saw Trump speak about people with disabilities, my sister-in-law has disabilities and I never, I've never been so angry. Yeah. And so <laughs> hurt. Yes. I really felt that this is not the person to protect my country. This is not the person to protect my sister-in-law. This is not the person to protect me. Uh, really, you know, I think in terms of approaching this election, um, especially in the light of kind of the darkness that feels like we're in right now as a country, you know, we have 5% of the world population, 25% of the COVID um, deaths. So it's really, it really doesn't track. And the cruelty and the rhetoric and the divisiveness and the dangerousness um, that's happening in the White House is really scary. So before we leave, what do you think the best things that your viewers and people who follow you should do to make sure their voice is heard for the election? What are the kind of activities do you, or do you plan on doing and what would you recommend other people do? Well, I want to answer it and then I have a question to you back. Um, so in light of the fact that I felt that we were just a sure win last time. There was no way that people could have a different opinion. I really started listening. I started listening. I started reading a lot. I did a lot of postcards. Um, we're probably at the end of when that will be helpful, but I reached out to voters that weren't registered and encouraged them to register. Um, and I think activism is a scary word because it sounds like you have to be like up on all the issues in this act and this legislative. It's not about that. It's about do you, what do you care about and how do you communicate that to your community, to your friends and family? How do you reach out to their empathy and their moral compass? And I'm not here to tell anybody who to vote for. I'm just here to tell them that this is what I think, this is what I believe. And that when you go into that ballot, um, booth or when you're filling out your ballot at home, um, that's between you and your soul and your God or whatever you believe in. Um, don't succumb to pressure of those around you. Don't succumb to my pressure. Um, I think a lot of people are in this kind of um, echo chamber and this pressure chamber and feel compelled to vote with their husband or with their friends or with their community. Like a vote is incredibly, incredibly personal. So I would encourage everyone to go to IamAVoter.com and yep. register, find out where your place, make a plan. Um, I looked into my plan yesterday. I love to vote early in person. My husband loves an absentee ballot. So he's going to request his absentee ballot and send his in. I feel a great deal of um, pride going and voting in person and getting yep. my paper. Um, I know it's a little bit more challenging this year because there's a pandemic, but early voting starts in LA on October 30th. Oh. So <laughs> weekend um, and go in person in a mask and a shield. Um, it's important to me. Um, so that's probably what I'll do. Um, but what is your voting plan? I'm voting absentee because um, I, it's how typically, because if I'm here voting, I can make sure I vote and not worry about having to miss a vote. Um, so I'm going to, I've already requested my absentee ballot. And as soon as it arrives, I'm going to vote. I have one 
more question for you before we leave. And make sure you sign it. You have to sign your ballot. Make sure you seal it the right way. Make sure someone, you know, witnesses it the right way. Just follow the directions. Whatever the directions tell you to do, follow them, please. Um, my last question is, for people that feel like they're not political or right. their voice doesn't really matter, they're maybe not really in a purple state or maybe they are, maybe they're in a red state, a blue state, and they don't feel like their vote really matters. Right. Why does it matter? Your vote matters because the last election was decided on a few thousand votes in a few states. So every voice matters, every vote matters. And you just, our constitutional right is to be heard, to, to vote every four years for a new president. And I just feel that this president is so far from the norm and so far away from my values that I want to do everything I can to make sure he's defeated. And Joe Biden's going to lead this country in a much better direction. He's going to make sure that we come together as a, as a country. And if Joe wasn't your primary choice, it doesn't matter because what he's going to do is work with all of us who also ran and put our legislation into law. He's going to sign them. So if, if Liz was your candidate or Bernie was your candidate or Kamala or Amy or anyone, it, it, it's, it's great because you, all those ideas we are still working on. And so everything that we've wanted to do by running, we're putting into bills and we're going to find the bipartisan support we need to pass them into law and Joe Biden will sign them. And Joe Biden's vision for the country is really strong. He's actually absorbed so many of the ideas that other people ran on um, and amplified our voices on a level that we could never have expected. So for example, I talked a little bit about um, equal pay, affordable daycare, universal pre-K, paid leave. That was my family bill of rights, plus some maternal mortality and some tax benefits if you want to adopt a child or if you need IVF. So to make sure anyone could be a parent. And he adopted an amazing platform of, of almost all the issues that I ran on on my family bill of rights. He's not only endorsed, but he's lifting up in a way that I could never have. So the truth is he can be someone who brings us all together, lifts us all up, and he's going to change where this country is going and he's going to build it back better. So it helps everyone, you know, for your sister-in-law, for your family, for your um, friends um, and, and remember what's right about our country. And so I'm very excited to vote for Joe and Kamala. I'm very excited to work hard for them. And I hope that, um, that anyone who wasn't planning on voting will vote, vote your conscience and vote your, your hopes for the future. And I think Joe can do all of that. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks guys for tuning in. Remember to register to vote. You can go to IamAvoter.com. They'll do everything for you. It's one stop shopping right there. Um, thank you so much. Vote early and vote. Thank you. Well, so and thanks for all your fans. Thank you for, uh -oh. And thank you for, for letting me join you. Well, thanks, them. Thank you so much. Have Bye. a great day. Stay safe. Take care. Bye.